The Red Hand of Evil, Chapter 8, First Part Caught in the stare of those glittering eyes, Annette was several times more ashamed than she was scared. I never had any interest in any of that, she thought. But she couldn't say the words. No, I know it, she said, mustering all her strength in an effort to put on a straight face. The Countess nodded. That made us reevaluate the human race. You might say we gave them the respect they were due. We thought your kind would need to be exterminated, or gathered up and sent off to some dimension. And yet you simply would have returned, in time. In her heart, Annette heaved a sigh. Not the sort prompted by being impressed. And the sort that came from disgust. Are humans really such incredible creatures? The thought rose through her like bile. And that held the human race in complete contempt. When she was a child, and the villagers had come to her father, the mayor, with this or that request were so pitiful, so servile. And the same was true of the people she'd seen in the capital. Unable to even understand the system the nobility had created, and they sheepishly made use of what they could, perhaps one millionth of the system's capabilities, but attempted to create nothing of their own. Yet they fervently researched the culture of the nobility to the point of forsaking all earthly pleasures, putting together such infantile hypotheses even Annette could understand them, and to her it appeared utterly inane. What was this conclusion the Countess spoke of? Interest reared in its heavy head, and then quickly returned to normal. That was something that had happened thousands of years in the past. It had no bearing on Annette's daily life. Wait here for a while. I know not what will happen later, but for now you're safe. Feeling relief seeping into her chest, Annette took a seat on a nearby sofa. There was a boy with me, she said, her lips only able to move due to the relief that filled her heart. What'll become of him? This is the first I've heard of him. Might he be with the formidable foe who pursues the Grand Duke? If such is the case, he is in danger. He could get caught in the crossfire. I can't imagine what manner of battle it shall be, but it would leave him far from safe. I know not whether even we shall be safe. But that's... Annette had nothing to finish that with. Like the Countess, she couldn't begin to imagine what shape a battle between that giant and D might take, or how it might conclude. And she was afraid to even think about it. Page break. On a diagram spread in midair, a green point of light was on the move. From the exterior and interior views, it was clear that the diagram was schematics for the train. This is the control room, or maybe the driver's seat would be a better name for it, said the horse voice. But since this gives us a vantage point for the entire layout of the train, it tells us the passenger's movements. There's no way we could miss him. He's got plenty of gumption, and he's headed right this way. How does he know we're in here? asked D. The train probably told him, this is his kingdom. He's got more unseen lackeys than you can shake a stick at. But fighting him here is too dangerous. There was no need to mention the presence of the reactor. D was already making for the door. Hold up. I'm coming to you. Bick said, ready to follow after him. Don't budge from here. The hunter told him without ever turning around. The boy froze in place. Still, he spoke, saying, Why not? 
I could be useful in helping you rescue the little lady. Instead of trying to be useful, the hoarse voice began. You'd be more helped by not getting in our way. Just stay here and behave yourself. Oh. I just know you're going to tail us no matter what we say. I'll just make you snooze a while. The left hand reached for his shoulder. Just before it could touch him, the boy used every muscle to bound toward the door ahead of him. <laughs> Treat me like I'm dead weight, will you? I'm through asking for help. I'll do as I please. And when you guys get into a jam, I ain't gonna help. Just remember that. And the door shut, cutting off part of Pick's final remark. My, but is me the spunky little bastard? Said a voice that could only be taken as a wry grin. Sure must be sweet on that girl. And the kid's ready to give his life for her. Dee's lips moved. The horse voice filled with surprise. But then, the board of the Noble Mental Research Center said it all. Still, he shouldn't be so determined. So introspective at such a young age. You really can't apply their new view to all humans, no siree. Just like the nobility's got some that are okay, and some that are messed up. So it goes with humans, too. The squirt's okay, but to be so damned. The rest of the horse horse's words were also truncated by the door. Page break indicated by a small cross. D headed straight on an intercept course with the enemy. Naturally, there was no thought of a net on his mind. Page break. One million dollars as agreed. The bag set on the table shifted slightly. Due to the gold coins that filled it, it looked as soft and lumpy as clay. The owner of that bag sat in a wheelchair flanked by bodyguards, one of whom swallowed hard and said, That's a hell of a payday. For that much, you could run a whole town on the frontier for a hundred years. On the other hand, Make a mistake and that million dollars won't be worth dirt to you. And the man in the wheelchair said in a horrible monotone and that made the guard wince. Even someone as famous across the frontier as D can't take on Grand Duke Drago and expect to come away unscathed. I know that name, D replied. The secretary who sat at a desk a good distance away punching their conversation into a typewriter pressed her hand to her chest and slumped over the machine. Her expression had dissolved in rapture, for she'd heard Dee's voice. But I'd heard he'd died in the distant past. And the hunter continued. A little over five thousand years ago, or so they say, the man, his employer, concurred with a nod. Though he is described here as a man, that could be determined by his voice alone. The head that emerged from his gorgeously embroidered robe was fully contained by an iron mask. Not only that, but the hands that poked from his sleeves were also sheathed in gleaming silver gauntlets all the way down to the tips of his fingers. From the tremble in his voice, it was clear that his monotone was actually due to his training. And the fierce emotion from his voice Indeed, he was destroyed, but what he built still lives somewhere out on the frontier, the legendary Tube Express, for example. It seems as enormous train, like some sort of huge hotel or perhaps a factory of sorts, it races through transparent tubes at nearly the speed of sound, as to why he would construct such a thing, and whether purely for sightseeing, for some other purpose. Even now, views vary, and any conclusions are fog-bound. One theory has it that it was built for conducting outrageous experiments, but that remains unclear. What's gone won't be coming back, Dee said. There was a tone that could permeate rock. Why dig it up again? A dozen days ago, 
I gave a traveler lodging at my home. That was the first mistake. At first blush, he looked to be a timid man. But at night, his true nature suddenly became apparent, and he killed my entire family. I asked him then who he was, and he told me he was a human who had been transformed by Grand Duke Drago. Five thousand years ago, he was abducted by the Grand Duke, and used as a guinea pig in certain experiments. As a result, he said his veins flowed with the blood of a noble, who by day might walk in the light of the sun without harm. And when he called on our house, it had been by the sunlight hours of day. Oh, if only I hadn't noticed him. His face was fine as any peach blossom, his eyes calm. His neck was fully exposed and free of fang marks. But that doesn't himself me of sin. My children were against letting him stay with us. No doubt a childish instinct or something and let them see through him. I scolded my children, told them our family had a tradition of showing compassion to strangers, and invited him in. Compassion, tradition, what had I done? He said he wouldn't make me one of them. Told me to put my family to rest. And as he left, he added something. That the Grand Duke Drago who'd made him what he was. It's better with the frontier in a train that resembled a huge castle. Though the train and the tube around it have vanished beneath the sands, they neither rust nor decay. Even now it lies quietly beneath the sand, awaiting the hour of its resurrection. Naturally, its master Grand Duke Drago, too, is merely in a long slumber, awaiting his own hour of resurrection in a coffin, secured somewhere in the train. My mission in life is set, D. Find where that train rests out on the frontier, and drive a wooden stake through Grand Duke Drago's heart as he slumbers there. And once the Grand Duke's been destroyed, drive another one right through the center of his ashes. In all eternity, I can never make up for my sin. But once you've done this, the souls of my three children, my wife, my parents, and a score of our servants will be able to take their place with the Lord at last. The man in the odd mask trembled violently from head to foot. It was a mad spasm of grief and anger. There could be no doubt it would become you lunacy in a matter of seconds. A black gloved hand grabbed the bag. You'll take the job, then, the employer's other guard said, the words escaping in a tone of relief. I'll contact you periodically, D told him, and then he turned his back to the man. I'll go too, his employer said, his voice following the hunter. I'll go with you. Let me drive a stake through Grand Duke Drago's heart. Please take me with you. D slipped at the door. The voice continued to howl madly. Vengeance for my children. Vengeance for my parents and my wife. Rip the Grand Duke's heart out and let me drink its gushing blood. Was the Iron Armor intended to deny his employer his freedom? But neither that mask did he gnash the fangs of a noble. Patrick. D closed the door. Suddenly he was in a vast area. Move this don't beat all. The horse voice said sarcastically, though its tone carried some surprise. Countless gravestones and monuments loomed before D. A train with its own graveyard. Maybe we should call this the Afterlife Express. Oh, and they've got names carved in them. They're all human names, said D. All the folks who died after being used in their experiments? That's one unexpectedly thoughtful noble. But what's the meaning of these flowers? Before every grave were flowers that looked freshly picked. 
and their petals were even covered with water droplets. No way that was the Grand Duke doing. Who in blazes, then? Of course, from the very start, no reply had been expected from Dee, but sensing something beyond the pale, a face formed in the palm of the left hand. Its tiny eyes took in the vast graveyard, and caught sight of the gigantic figure standing at one end of the car. Such a gorgeous man. Your beauty has earned an introduction. I'm Grand Duke Drago. D. The Grand Duke's enormous frame quaked for an instant, but it was unclear whether D caught that or not. Oh. Such murderous intent. A man who calls himself D. Even your killing lust is exquisite. At the moment, I'm trembling. It's so pure, so unalloyed. But the something else makes my chest quake. D, D, D. Who named you thus? I know. No, I know nothing. Your left hand. Something inhabits it, does it not? He said so. Said that you were his only... something. He. Who is he? The giant spoke without once pausing for breath, and it took several seconds for him to finish. However, it was clear he was in a confused state. What was it that startled this ancient fiend risen from the far reaches of time? And how would D counter him? First part, end.